But as we mentioned so many times from this member, the religion of Al-Islam says that there's only one human being who's infallible, and that is the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And since we find that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked that question to a little girl from the companions, he asked her, where is Allah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions as well asked that question to people. If someone comes after that, no matter who they are, companion or other than companion, if the Nabi said it, then it's not permissible for an Imam al Suyuti or I or you or anyone else to have an issue with it. Another category of people, when they hear that question, where is Allah, they become agitated and they become angry. They say, why would you name the topic of a discussion like that? Why would you deal with this issue in the Khutbatul Juma? The Muslims are being persecuted in Syria. The non-Muslims are coming together and they're coming up with ideas for our Somalia. So many issues are taking place with the Muslims. Why are you addressing this issue in that class tonight? And that's also a position that's not acceptable because where is Allah is an extremely important issue. Which brings us to the third category of people. Third category of Muslims are those people who don't have an idea where Allah is. A large number of Muslims, if this question was posed to them, they would give the wrong answer that goes against what the Quran established and what the Prophet brought. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they would say that Allah is everywhere. And what they mean by that, Allah is really everywhere and not explaining it. Allah is here with us and so forth and so on. And that's the wrong answer. So taking this opportunity today, because the subject is so vast, we won't be able to do justice to the subject tonight because there's so much information. We just want to address the issue here in this masjid as the first part of the presentation. What does the Quran say? Only the Quran about where Allah is. And we're only going to get through half of what the Quran says because there's so many ways that the Quran, the book of Allah, the kalam of Allah has established this issue. And then later on, inshallah, we'll deal with other aspects of the presentation. So that question, where is Allah? Where is Allah? First of all, the reason why I said that this is an important issue, ikhwani, is because Allah obviously is our ilah. And we need to worship him and we need to know what we're doing, who we're worshiping. We need to know that. Some of those Kufav, Quraysh, Mecca, they came to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they wanted to know from him, describe to us your Rabb, Ya Muhammad. Is he made out of gold? Is he made out of wood? Is he made out of silver? We want to know this God Allah that you're worshiping, the one who comes to your mind. What is he like? What is his lineage? The Nabi remained quiet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Ta'ala revealed the simple, easy, short surah that is heavy in its magnitude and its meaning. He revealed, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. No, our Allah, he's not made out of wood, gold, he's not made out of this or that, he doesn't have a lineage. He is unique and he is a samad. He is not born and he doesn't have children and no one is like unto him. This fact alone, Ummah islam goes to show for all of us who are living in the UK, where on a daily basis, the popular culture of this country is chiseling at the aqidah of our children and ourselves. The Muslim girl, the Muslim man says something like, look, I have a problem with you. The big man upstairs is going to deal with us. She didn't mean it that way, but that's something that comes off of the tongue of a person. Allah, the big man upstairs is going to deal with you. La. Friday the 13th, the Ta'weev, all of these issues that we have in our minds that go against the Aqidah as a result of being bombarded on a daily basis, it can have a person twisted and tripped up as to who Allah is and who Allah isn't, where Allah is and where Allah isn't subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the fact that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed this issue, who Allah is and what does he do? It's a clear indication. We have a religious responsibility to find out about these issues. It's not okay for our young brothers, our young sisters to be brought up saying, I have a problem with this type of subject. Another issue Ikhwani, that proves this point and it is proven throughout the Quran consistently. No way is it fathomable, is it, it's not conceivable that Allah 
We send down to us, as we mentioned so many times, a religion that makes everything crystal clear from the mundane affairs. How to relieve oneself, how to go to sleep, how to dress, so forth and so on. And then that same religion comes and is quiet about where Allah is, who Allah is. It's just not conceivable. It's not consistent with the hikmah that Allah has shown us clearly throughout the legislation of this religion. In the Quran, there are seven ayat, seven, showing that it's been repeated so many times. Seven ayat describing to us where Allah is in the same way that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is mustawin al arsh he said in the quran subhanahu wa ta'ala allah alladhi khalaqa as-samawati wal ard wa ma baynahuma fi sittati ayamin thumma istawa ala al arsh it is allah your lord allah is the one who created the heavens and he created the earth and then he went above his throne seven ayat mention that not one not two not three seven ayat there's an individual who he comes and he doesn't accept that because he's too busy with politics he wants to overthrow the government he wants to establish his jama'ah he wants to be a politician in islam and as a result of that these types of issues that are connected with aqidah which are the fundamental issues they are secondary they're on the periphery and as a result of that people are against these issues and they are paramount and important seven ayat ar-rahman ala al-arsh istawa allah our lord ar-rahman who is merciful enough to give us islam and to give us all of the blessings that we have he is over his throne in a way that befits his majesty. If you were to ask the non-Muslim, the Christian, close your eyes and imagine your God. Many of them, some people from Africa, African Americans, they will co close their eyes and have an image of a white man. A white man with blonde hair and blue eyes sitting on a big chair and he's dangling his feet like that. Islam didn't leave this to our imagination to figure out who Allah is, where Allah is. Does he come to the earth? Is he in the stomach of a mother? Does he have a mother? Does he? Islam didn't leave it like that for us. Seven ayat that clearly established he's over his throne. The great scholar of Islam, Al Imam Malik, tremendous scholar of Islam. Some man came to him from the Muslims and he wanted to argue and debate how is Allah over that throne? I want to know how. Allah didn't make it your business. He made it wajib upon everybody to be here for Salatul Juma. He made it wajib for someone to stand up here and give the khutbah. He made it wajib for the lady to wear hijab. He made it wajib for us to fast in Ramadan, those who have the ability. He didn't make it the sunnah, nor did he make it wajib on anyone to try to figure out and find out the details of how he is over his throne. That's not our job. That's not our business. The man came to an Imam Malik and said, tell me, how is Allah over his throne? And Imam Malik mentioned to that man, the istiwa of Allah, him being above, him going over. That's well known to the Arabs. You ask any Arab who knows this language, he's going to say it means to go up into a sin. It is known what it means. How he did it is unknown. To believe it is wajib. And to ask about it and investigate it, that's an innovation. And Imam Malik got that from people who came before him like his Shaykh Rabi al Rai, and it's also been narrated on our mother Umm Salama radiallahu anha. And as we've been mentioning over and over again in this masjid, if the companions radiallahu anhum did not engage in these types of issues and questions and discussions, then we shouldn't engage in them. We should leave them alone. It is as simple as that. The second issue about those mini ayat how do we know that Allah is over his throne and above in the heavens? There are seven ayat that repeat the same thing over and over again. That Allah is mustawin al arsh. He is over his throne in a way that befits his majesty. Another way, another tariqah that we know that Allah Azzawajal is above his throne is the word in Arabic which is al fawqiya That ayat of the Quran and ahadith, meaning they describe that, the, that Allah Azzawajal is above. Ayat, he said about himself, وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِي Allah is Al-Qahir, you're Abdul Qahir, I'm Abdul Qahir. From his names is, he is Al-Qahir, the one who is mighty. He is dominant. 
He said that he is Al Qahir and he is above his creation. He's above his servants. In another ayah, he described the malaika subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said about the malaika, Yakhafuna Rabbahum min fawqihim. Those angels, they fear their Lord who was above them. And every Muslim knows the youngest brothers in this masjid who have their intellect, they know that the malaika are in the heavens. Right now in this Juma, something is taking place that the Nabi has told us about. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Majtama'a qawm fi bayta min buyutillah. Yatluna kitab Allah, wa yatadara sunuhu fi ma baynahum illa nazalat alayhim al sakina, wa hafathum al rahma, wa nazala fihim, wa hafathum al malaika, wa dhakarahum Allahu fi man indahum. Every time people come together in any masjid, big or small, Mecca, Medina, Bayt al Maqdis, any masjid, they read the book of Allah. And they study the book of Allah between themselves. Every time that happens, Sakina comes down upon them. The Rahmah of Allah comes down upon them. And the Malaika come down. The Malaika in the heavens, a group of them come down. In addition to all of the Malaika that are with each and every one of us already, all of the Malaika who are writing, who comes into the door already, all of the Malaika who, whatever they're doing, there are others who come down to listen to the Khutbah. They don't come up, they don't come from the side, they come from the heavens. And Allah Azzawajal is above that. Allah is above that seven heaven. So the point here is, there are so many ayat of the Quran, so many ahadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that describe that issue of above, al-fawqiyya. Yakhafuna rabbahum min fawqihim. They are fearful of their Lord who is above them. There is an angel who's responsible for blowing into the horn Yom Qiyamah. Allah created him and he's looking at the throne of Allah and he's in the heavens, the Nabi said. He's looking up at the throne of Allah and he doesn't blink out of fear that he'll be commanded to blow the horn at the moment of blinking. And the ayat or the hadith said he's above. Allah is above him and he's looking at the throne of Allah. So the point here is Another way that the Quran establishes for us that Allah Azza is above over the seven heavens is that issue of those ayat and ahadith that say he's above, he's above. In addition to that, there are many ayat and ahadith, Quranic ayat that describe the su'ud, that the things go up to Allah, our deeds, our actions, our dua, the malaika, Jibreel, they go up to Allah Azza Allah Ta'ala mentioned in this third tariqah from the mini ayat, not one, not two, not three, from the mini ayat he mentioned in the Quran, Ta'arujul malaikatu wa ruh ilayhi fi yawmin kana miqdaru khamsina alf sana. The angels and Jibril, they go up to Allah, they make the ascension, and they go up to Allah in a day that to your reckoning is like 5,000 years. Allah mentioned in another ayat, the su'ul, things ascending up to him. Ilayhi, yas'adu al-kalima tayyib, wal-amal salih yarfa'uhu. To Allah, the good words go up to him, and the good actions go up to him. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the companion of the Nabi who understood the Qur'an, he said about this, that the good word, it is the dhikr of Allah, it's the salat that you make. It's the dhikr that you make. It's the khutbah that you give. It's the recitation of the Quran. It's your praising Allah in any shape, form, or fashion. It goes up to Allah. And the good deeds, Abdullah ibn Abbas said, all of the fara'id that you do like this juma, it goes up to Allah Azawajal. In the hadith that was collected by Imam al-Tirmidhi, the companion Abdullah ibn Sa'ib, he said that the Prophet talked about Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the time in which the sun leaves the zenith and it makes the zawal. That time in the day, that time in the life of the Muslim. The Nabi said about that time Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam innaha sa'atun tuftahu abwabu sama fa inni uhibbu an yas'ada li fiha amalu salih. Whenever the zenith, the sun goes past the zenith midday, he said, at that time, there is an hour that the heavens are opened up. The doors of the heavens are opened up. 
and I want my deeds and I hope that my deeds will go up to Allah at that time. So there are too many ayat. Allah said about Isa ibn Maryam sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Isa inni mutawafiq wa rafi'uka ilayh. Isa, I'm going to cause you to die. And that has multiple interpretations. One interpretation, I'm going to cause you to sleep, to sleep. And I'm going to raise you up to me. Too many ayah, too many ahadith. Isa, I'm going to cause you to die. And I'm going to raise you up to me. So where, where is Allah speaking about this issue when he says he's going to raise Isa ibn Maryam up to him? Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And if Isa ibn Maryam went up, as we believe, he's going to come back down. So all of those ayat, all of those ahadith, the fourth point. How do we know that Allah is above? All of those ayat that talk about the inzal and the tanzil and the nazul, all of those ayat that talk about things coming down, they are points and indications that Allah is above. Isa is going to come down. Allah said in the Quran, Inna fi laylatul qadr. We revealed this book and send it down in laylatul qadr. We send down the iron where people make guns or whatever and knives. With that iron, there's a lot of harm that can come through it. A lot of power and might comes from that art, from that iron. The ayah said, We sent it down. We send down that rain from the sky and it's blessed. And as a result of that, the vegetation comes up. It's not okay and it's not acceptable for Muslims to come and debate about these issues. And people want to debate you about that, Ya Abdullah. The answer is the same answer of Al Imam Malik. If he wants to debate you, if he doesn't like it, if he has a problem with it, you tell the individual, I know my religion. I don't have any problems with what these ayahs are saying. You go look for someone who's on what you're on and debate him. From the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam concerning that rain, which comes from the heavens, doesn't come from below. That rain, from his sunnah is, he used to send his stuff out in the rain to get the barakah of the rain. They asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why do you put your stuff out in the rain? Why do you put your weapons of war? Why do you put your saddle that you ride on your horse or your camel? Why do you put your sword, your spear, your shield? Why do you put your hat, your imam? Why do you put it out in the rain to get it wet? He told the people, because the rain just came down recently from my Lord. Your child, when it starts raining, take your child outside and do the buttock of the rain and put the rain on the head of your child. Doesn't mean to leave him out there in the torrential storm. But when it first starts raining, there's barak in that rain. Why? Because the Nabi said, it just came recently from my Lord. The rain comes from above and Allah is above that. He told us sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam and people being people who have ulu al-himma. إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهَ فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ فَإِنَّهُ فِي وَسَدِ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَعْلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَفَوْقُهُ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ وَتَفَجِّرُ مِنْهُ أَنْهَارُ الْجَنَّةِ When you people make dua, and when you make dua, naturally you're going to raise your hands like this to make dua to Allah. So even from the fitrah, this issue has been planted in the seed of Bani Adam. It's when his mind gets corrupted, he starts to have these debates and these doubts. He said, when you people make dua to Allah, ask Allah, ask Allah for the Jannah al-Firdaus. He said, because the Jannah al-Firdaus, wherever it is, above, above, he said that that Jannah al-Firdaus, it's okay, Shaykh. He said that the Jannah al-Firdaus, it is in the middle of al-Jannah. And it is the highest part of al-Jannah, and above the Jannah al-Firdaus is the throne of Allah. So these heavens that we have, this is part of our Iman. These earths, the earths, the seven earths that we know about. There are some people who will come to you and argue and say, no, they are not seven earths. We're, oh, we only know one earth. There are seven earths and there are seven heavens. 
above that seventh heaven, the Jannah al firdaus And above that is the throne of Allah. One hadith said that the roof of the Jannah, the highest Jannah, the roof of that is the throne of Allah. And those ayats that we mentioned, those seven ayat, they establish that Allah Azza wa is over his arsh. And it's not for you and not for me to imagine how, when, and why. Don't close your eyes and be like the non-Muslims, the kuffar, and picture a man sitting there because he is not the big man in the sky. The Muslim didn't mean it that way. That wasn't what they meant. I'm sure that's not what they meant. But that type of description of Allah is not okay. Ikhwani, concerning this issue about where Allah Azza wa is, even the kuffar of the Quran knew this issue and it's not acceptable for Muslims to be in doubt about this. And then we hung on to weak, weak arguments. And Imam al-Suyuti, are you bigger than Imam al-Suyuti? That's not a delil and that's knowledge, not knowledge in Islam. And Imam al-Nawwi, and Imam al-Nawwi said that it doesn't mean what you're saying. That's not knowledge in al-Islam. Because although, again, we respect those two scholars and other than them, the companions are greater than them. And the ones who came after the companions were greater than them. And the one who came after those who came after the companions are greater than them. And even during their time, there were people who were bigger than them who didn't take that position. So in our religion, the argument is not Sheikh so-and-so said, and this method, that's not the delil and that's not knowledge. Concerning those ayat that establish where Allah Azza wa is, and I want you people to really consider this, is what happened with Fir'aun. Musa gave da'wah to Fir'aun. And clearly Musa being the kalim of Allah, a special prophet and messenger from the five prophets and messengers, you can rest assured he didn't leave any stone unturned in terms of giving da'wah to Fir'aun. Allah Ta'ala mentioned something that Fir'aun said to Musa about where Allah is. He mentioned waqala Fir'aun, Ya Haman, ibni li sarhan la'alli ablugu al-asbab asbab al-samawat fa attali'u ila ilah musa wa inni la'adhunnuhu kathiba how is it possible that Fir'aun who was born as a kafir he's an imam of kufr he's going to get a tremendous punishment yawm al-qiyamah and yet after hearing the dawah of Musa Fir'aun said to his minister Haman hey Haman Build for me a tower and make it go in the sky because I want to climb up the tower and I want to have a look at this God of Musa. But I think Musa is lying. Lying about what? Musa told him, as Abdullah ibn Abbas said, as the ulama of the Quran said, Abdullah ibn Abbas said that Musa clearly told Fir'aun, Allah is in the heavens. Fir'aun didn't want to accept it. So he told his minister, Build for me a ladder. Build for me a tower. I'm going to go up there in his haughtiness and his arrogance. And I'm going to see for myself. Do I see the God of Musa? Not only that. These kuffar who are walking around here. Every Christian or Muslim who used to be a Christian here. The main prayer of the Christians is the Lord's prayer. And I only mention this just to tell you. It's not acceptable for kuffar to know this and Muslims not to know. I'm not mentioning this as a delil in our religion. Those people, if you ask any Christian, practicing, not practicing, what's the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer says in the beginning, Our Father, Allah, A'udhu Billah, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You have a special name. Maybe they're talking about the Asma of Allah, Al Husna, Allahu Alam. He's not our Father, but the point is, they said, Our Father, Our God who is in heaven. How is the Muslim now going to come and argue and debate? No, Allah is not in the heavens and he established it in only half of the ways that the Quran has mentioned to us concerning where Allah is. Ummat al-Islam. This issue is a microcosm of a bigger, wider, greater issue. And the greater issue is we have to learn our aqidah. We have to learn our aqidah because, again, the importance of the aqidah is that Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to ask you, who is your Lord? Who do you worship? 
Some people, their response will be, I worship Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people will respond, the lisan of their hal. They say, will say, I don't worship anyone at all. Because the Lord that they worship, he's not above, he's not below, he's not here, he's not there. They don't know where he is because of the philo philosophical approach of trying to understand these issues. Do what the companions did. These ayat were mentioned by Allah Azza wa Jalla and the Prophet spoke about them Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions stopped. And they didn't dig into these issues to confuse themselves or to confuse the people after us. But if a person insists on being confused, he only does so to the destruction and the detriment of himself. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nas'alallah tawfiq wa said that. Alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulillahi amma ba'd. Although Allah Azza wa Jalla is above the seven heavens and he's over his throne in a way that befits his majesty, he nonetheless is still with us. He established that in the Quran. He is with you wherever you go. You fly a plane, he's with you. Go in a submarine, he's with you. You awake, he's with you. If you're asleep, he's with you. If you go into the cave, he's with you. Wallahu ma sabirin, in Allah ma muttaqin, in Allah ma ladin at taqo. Allah is with those who have sabr, He's with those who have a taqwa. Allah Ta'ala mentioned the condition with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and his companion Abu Bakr. If Yaqulli Sahibi la tahzan in Allah ma'ana. When they were in the cave and he was with his companion, he told Abu Bakr, Don't worry, don't be sad, don't worry, don't be afraid. Allah is with us. He's the third of the two. Never is there Najwa. A group of people come and they want to plot in secret. They can be three, they can be four, they can be five, more or less. Allah is with them. Allah is with the munafiqeen. Allah is with everyone. But He's with the people, how? He's with the people in His ability to see from where He is. He's with the people in His ability to hear. He's with the people in His ability of the knowledge, the powerful knowledge that He has. So the Nabi, when he used to address the people, and we finished with this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I've done from this masjid, in the beginning of the khutbah, when he came to ashadu an la ilaha illallah, when he said, inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu, when he came to the shahada, doing the khutbah, he would raise his hand up like that. He would address the people, and he would ask the people, what are you people going to say, yawm al qiyamah, when you die, and Allah ask you about me. They said, we bear witness you told us the truth. You informed us where Allah is. You informed us the halal and haram. You didn't leave anyone in or on haysa baysa. Everyone knows. He put his finger up again and he pointed to this side. He said, oh Allah, bear witness. And he put his finger up, oh Allah, bear witness. And those in the middle, oh Allah, bear witness. And those on the side. How is someone going to come and say Allah is everywhere? Why didn't he just say Allah, bear witness? Why didn't he do something like that? It is these types of philosophical debates and discussions. I say to the young brothers, leave the argumentative people want to make jidal, leave them alone. Make these topics because they are a large group of Muslims who don't know. But don't make these topics because we want to push back and fight those people and refute those people. Leave those people alone. Tell them, go and look for the other people from those deviant ways and you discuss these issues and debate with these issues as for me i want to be on the way i'm speaking of what you should say i want to be on the way of the people of alul hadith starting off with the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he asked the little girl sallallahu alaihi wasallam hey little girl where is allah the little girl said over the heavens she had no philosophy no philosophical approach who am i little girl she said you're rasulullah he told the man, free this girl. She's a believer. She's a mu'mina. The one who knows that and understands that, that's part of the aqidah of a person who has correct iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our aqidah and protect the aqidah of our shabab. And may Allah azza wa jal don't allow us to check out of this hayat the dunya except that we know who he is, where he is, what he does, and that we know our religion and we know in detail who that man was that he sent to us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqimu salat yarhamakumullah